Welcome to Second Table, where we discuss spirituality, philosophy, and psychology. I'm your host, Winston Janice. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening again. Welcome to the Second Table podcast. I am here today, very excited for this interview with one of my former professors when I was at Boston University School of Theology, Brian Stone, who is an American theologian, who is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, and the E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism at Boston University School of Theology, and a co-director of the Center for Practical Theology. Uh, He's taught a course, which then um, turned into a book called Faith and Film, and now he's working on a new project, which I was hoping to talk to him about. Uh, a book tentatively called Christianity and Horror Film. Thanks for uh, being with me today, Brian. It's a pleasure and sure good to connect with you once again, Winston. Yeah, yeah. We took uh, evangelism and contemporary culture as well. I was at Boston University. It was really really good. And I know you too had been involved in some other things, obviously, at the school. Like we we crossed paths while I was uh, doing a uh, an experience over at um, uh, Pub Church, it was known Church, as yeah. a little emergent church start, right? So that was good to connect through that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was great to be a part of that. I'm glad yeah. to get to know you there. Right. And I, I, that Pub Church is not still going, but Pub Churches are a very important thing. And I, I hope someday some person will do a serious study of Pub Churches around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's another topic of interest. Maybe some point we could it talk is. about. But yeah. Um, so so tell me about this book you're working on. What uh, what motivated you to want to write this book? Tell me a little bit about it. So I mean, I've always been interested in film, and I w- I grew up a member of the Church of the Nazarene. We weren't allowed to go to movies. Actually, it was very we're a very conservative evangelical denomination. Maybe mm. that's what made me want to go to them and study them and work with them all the more, you know, how that kind of thing happens. Mm. Uh, So probably 25 years ago, I began working on thinking about how to do it. I was teaching theology at Azusa Pacific University, and these were undergrad students who not all of them had theology or religious backgrounds at all. But I thought it'd be a great way to introduce them to theology would be to do it through film. Uh, So I worked on this course called Faith in Film, and it explores a variety of theological themes impaired up with different movies and trying to get through the apostles creed phrase by phrase well during that time i also i've always loved horror movies and i I don't even know what the psychology of that is for me (laughs) why that is the case cheryl my wife hates them i mean she won't even be in the same room uh if they're being played and so i have to kind of watch study these on my own like during my during the dark hours of the night. <laughs> um, Best time to do I've it, right? Been, I've, I've, I know, I've long been interested. Ever since I was a kid, I was interested in horror movies. So pair all that together, I began to think about how to do something on horror film. And probably 15, 20 years ago, I, um, I wrote a, just an article called Sanctification of Fear, where I was looking at how, kind of a, how uh, horror movies intersect with Christian theology. And that's really what this book seeks to do in a more expanded way. Um, the, the book is called Christianity and Horror Film right now, but what it wants to do is look at how Christianity has over the last hundred years shaped fear on the cinema. Hmm. Uh, the way we think about horror, the way we think about fear is not just to have, doesn't just show up in the abstract. And in different cultures, it gets different. It gets constructed and framed in different ways. Well, in Western cultures, thanks to their um, adherence to Christianity or Christendom, um, there's just it, overwhelmingly horror film has been shaped by Christian themes and uh, images and persons, priests, places, uh, practices. All of these have shaped the way we construct horror in the cinema. It's not that way around the world, of course. So, for example, if you watch witchcraft films in the Western cultures, they're going to be very much shaped by Christianity, uh-huh. and it's uh, chasing after witches. Uh, in Buddhist cultures, I mean, you watch um, some horror, witch horror in uh, Japan or China, especially China, 
it's not a, it's still got a religious dimension to it but it's not constructed obviously in christian coordinate through christian coordinates or symbols and it's very interesting it's actually more compatible um to rely on sort of supernatural means to affect some change in someone else or to do damage to somebody or hurt somebody mm. or to get love from somebody through witchcraft but it's more in harmony with the religious coordinates whereas in the west witchcraft was definitely understood to be rival to and a whole uh, separate uh, kind of religious uh, adherence. So I'm going chapter by chapter on this. I've been working, I'm already done with um, ghosts, witches, and, uh, and then demons and Satan. I put demons and Satan in the same, in the same chapter. Mm -hmm. And now I'm working hard on vampires. So I'm kind of working on the supernatural horror right now. Okay. But, and so the question for me is whether I try to make this a bigger book and bring in things like nature horror or psychological horror or social horror, mm. social horror like um, Get Out, those kinds of movies, mm -hmm. um, or whether I just like, this is it, I'm just going to do the, the supernatural horror. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot already. I mean, I probably already have a <laughs> book worth just in the four chapters on different kinds of supernatural horror. But when you get to things like zombies, uh, it's a different kind of ball game altogether. It's about less about supernature and more about other kinds of things. Yeah. And given the day and age that we live in with viruses, um, it's not surprising that zombies are still very popular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, very fascinating. I know that you had mentioned in that article, the sanctification of fear about how horror, uh, yeah, the, the religious... Um, symbols and imagery can sometimes be really still prevalent but they're they're um sort of watered down in terms of the potency on on how much of an impact they have uh on us uh with you know kind of the deeper questions we ask ourselves it's sort of like uh you know almost just from like almost like leftover relics or something <laughs> yeah. is that right right it's kind of like a fund that you draw on in the movies that's still very, because we're still a Christendom culture and Christianity has shaped us as a Western, as a Western culture. You can't really talk about horror without addressing the religious dimensions of it, but it's, it's not always clear to me that those are anything more than superficial um, out there, ways of kind of like triggering or pointing to something. I might change though a little bit on that. Uh, I mean, that was, I wrote that 20, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, at that point, I thought, well, I mean, religion, just because religion shows up in film does not necessarily mean that religion continues to have a vitality to it. Right. It just means that we have a fund of symbols and practices and narratives and stories and persons and places that in, in and through which uh, horror has been shaped. But I do think that... Um, as I continue to think about these things, that um, religion, not necessarily Christianity, but religion still has a potency uh, that doesn't go away. Hmm. And it is often expressed in and through the cinema. I think religiosity, if you just think about it without a tradition, just sort of the kind of practices um, that we participate in are still... Um, it still has some vitality to it. And especially when you think about off the beaten path religion. So paganism right. uh, or other sorts of naturalisms. Uh, there's still, I mean, horror represents a deeply religious approach to the universe. I mean, it's all about the transcendent, the metaphysical, or, and even the deeply psychological. Right. Uh, and those are all very ripe for religious we're thinking about religion. Right. But when you get deep into the psyche or out there and metaphysically into what is what is the case with reality, those are both of those directions are very, very religiously pregnant. Right. It's like uh, I think you uh, kind of wrapped up the article with that, talking about how many people still have a uh, sort of uh, spiritual or religious perspective. We all have a metaphysic. We all have a theology. They might not be attending church, but it's that spiritual but not religious uh, folks, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think that still continues to show up in horror. The, the I mean, the where I where I, my critique was that so 
Christian symbols or books or texts or whatever practices or people like a priest, um, they still are drawn upon by horror, but they may not have as um, relevant a uh, close connection to how what horror or what fear actually is. Just throwing a priest in a movie right. signals something, but it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a real deep connection there to Christianity just because you show a priest right. in a movie. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think some of this stuff may be a shift in all of our attitudes and thoughts. I, one of the uh, concepts that I really appreciated in the article um, that you shared was uh, the idea that good horror confronts us with our unconscious or, or conscious fears, uh, sort of the, you know, um, how would you put it, uh, just, you know, uh, exposing all of our deepest fears about the things we're not able to control, uh, whether it's nature or bodies or, you know, supernatural forces in the universe and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, David Cronenberg, the direct, the famous horror director talk, talk about horror as a genre of confrontation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way of thinking about it. It throws in our face. It confronts us with those shadow parts of um, our reality or thinking um, and, and then confronts us with them, whether that's an invasion of the body, an invasion from space, an invasion from supernatural, from the supernatural, whether it's like demons or something like that. Those things that kind of lurk in the recesses of our brains and our experience, horror just puts right in our face. Though sometimes it does its best work when it doesn't like jolt us, it just kind of does it in a creepy way, but it's still confronting us either with a metaphysically unknown or the psychologically unknown. Or, and now I really want to, I've been changing a lot on this over the, over the last decade, is just how important social horror is. And horror has always been interpreted metaphysically and psychologically. But there are some great social horror films uh, like Us or Get Out that have been coming out more recently. I think as we move to a more post-horror phase where the genre conventions of horror are cast aside but you still have scary movies but they don't rely on the conventions and the standards as much um social you can do a lot more interesting things with scaring us about society mm. i mean just think about already i mean how many people give it give in to conspiracy theories right and uh you know and are worried about what's going on in society or racial differences or immigrants um, they're all the scary people, our case. I mean, we're and, and and movies play off of those fears. Yeah. So it's not just what we don't know psychologically or or the kind of psychological uh, states that surface in us um, that are a source of horror or the metaphysically unknown, but also I think the social um, disequilibrium, the, the kind of social angst makes its way into horror film increasingly so that's i gotta think about that more i, I think it's true um, yeah. but it could be that social horror has always been with us and i'm just naming it as, as something more modern but it could be that you go all the way back and all of it's social horror perhaps uh, uh you know there's a couple things that uh, makes me uh think about but um you know it's funny i actually I don't really like watching horror myself. Uh, I'm like, that's too scary. But ironically, the, the horror that I will kind of do is actually through video games, like video games that have a horror dimension to it. And uh, I, I like uh, being in survival situations in games sometimes. And you uh, right you, you'd think that'd be even more scary because then it's kind of like, you know, I'm the player, I'm the character that's more involved in the story than just watching. But uh Maybe something about it being digitally represented or something is, but um, Ryan, you know, I think there are there are a lot of horror uh, video games. Horror, yeah, horror video yeah, games. yeah. You know, dead. Uh, I've only played a few, but uh, you know, Dead Space. You know, where there's zombie outbreak in a spaceship, and then there was uh, one I was really interested in that I felt like had a real deep dimension to it was uh, the Last of Us series. Uh, the, and the the Last of Us 2 came out recently. It's also in a post-apocalyptic, there's a zombie infection, uh, kind of a fungus that goes in the air and, and turns people into zombies. And um, But there was really, really powerful, like well-done characters and a lot of depth to it. But when you mentioned social horror, there were so many 
so many interesting themes in the second one in particular, especially even around our current uh, context of division yes. in our society. And one of the uh, groups that the characters face, they're called the, um, the Seraphites, or they call them the Scars. And this group of people are kind of religious fanatics. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they're telling people they have to kill them in order to get the sin out of them. And they worship this uh, woman who's a guru. And I'm just wondering if, I, I feel like this, you know, it reminds me too of like that, what's that, that game Halo where they call the, uh, the enemies the covenant, you know? They, there's this like, I, I almost think that now, like that, that social demand, maybe we fear like the religious fanatics and what the power of religion can do to us, you know? When we get carried away, right? I think that's right, and so it makes its way uh, in. It is interesting how sort of cult religion or or non majority religion shows up as a frightening thing. This also has a lot to do with witchcraft. So fringe religions or religions that threaten the power, the social power of a group, a witch does that, um, and that that's just long been a source of f- fear. And it made its way into the movies as well. Hmm. It's interesting to me that over half of all witch movies were made in recent years since 1960. So why is why are witches, why is witchcraft or religious minorities, why do they become more and more fearful? And I think as we become more of a pluralistic society, hmm. those uh, themes, those fears still become very, very important for us. Yeah. I'll tell you something else I think is interesting on this front is that um, you'd think that as we became more technological um, or relied on science more, that horror would, transcendent horror, supernatural horror, would become less interesting and less popular. But it's as popular as ever. Demons, (laughs) ghosts, they're still, these movies just keep churning out. Mm. Um, So there's something, what we do is we find those demons and those ghosts in our technology. That's what we do. Mm. So now like you can't watch a TV set without worrying that maybe something will come through it or you'll go through it. Right. Um, Or same with technology, other technologies, glitches um, in the internet. I mean, there's so many now internet horror movies where you're, you know, you get, you get, um, you confront your fear through the, through the online experience. Um, Black Mirror is all <laughs> about that, right? On Netflix? Yes. Oh, God, I love that stuff. Oh, um, it's so dark for me, you know? <laughs> it is dark. It's also really creative. They've just done really good quality. And that also does add to the staying power, I think, of any kind of horror movement. Right. Uh, how, 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 how much quality is there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gosh. Oh, well, you know what? I wonder that maybe part of the reason that we still see a lot of supernatural stuff in the you know horror genre is, um, you know, I've thought about this, like, why are we people drawn to media like Game of Thrones and Harry Potter? Uh, those are all, you know, as much as once again, we're, we might be materialistic, kind of scientifically uh, oriented society, but we still love that stuff. I think we have a hunger for magic and an enchanted world. And I think that the science, yeah, it takes that away. Um, and it doesn't have to take that away. But I think that's kind of our interpretation that, oh, now that we believe in science, you know, we can't believe in any right. of this other stuff, but we still want to, you know. We do, and there are paths, I mean, even scientific paths towards transcendent, which which make that possible. Like something, I think like a movie like Avatar, which isn't a horror movie, but where it's relying on a, a kind of more contemporary, modern scientific worldview of connectedness, um, but it's also very much about fantasy. It's a fantasy film. Uh, and I think that's true increasingly is that even though we might give up on institutional religion to a certain degree, um, the transcendent does not go away. And found in different paths. I mean, right. it can be found right through our technology, right through our emphasis on bodies and science. There's a lot of great science horror. Mm. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> yeah. partly because science has always been construed, long been construed as stepping on the turf of religion. Right. Um, but that's a little bit more complicated, I think, than it used to be, where that was just an easy either or. 
Yeah, exactly. absolutely. You had um, like uh, what was the uh, the oh come on the person is too fake who is too Jekyll uh, and Hyde. Uh huh. Yep. Jekyll and Hyde was all about um, so, the, it was a critique of science. Science had uncovered the 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 ego down deep inside and once you release it it's a different it's this really powerful thing that we should be afraid of mm. um, but that doesn't just go away in modernity and as we keep becoming more scientifically oriented you can see this even in the united states the distrust of science is almost as strong as the reliance on science it's you, you so the this is a great source of playing with fear is when you got scientific horror or outer space horror, those are really fertile still. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Not they, as much outer space horror as we used to have. Mm, yeah, they may say something. Right, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm very interested yeah, in the kind of, you know, connectedness and uh, overlap between science and theology and all that kind of stuff. You know, talking about the social, going back a little bit to like the social horror, I. I'm curious. I mean, I don't know if we could consider this a, a horror film or not, but like the the overwhelming kind of popularity of the Joker when it came out. Um, I, I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, do do we even consider that a horror film? It's more probably crime and drama, huh? <laughs> yeah, but I it comes very close to being horror. I think that yeah. that film especially. Yeah. Kind of kind there of was bursts out of the typical genre confines you know yeah there were there were uh certain elements of horror there i think absolutely i think even the fundamental nihilism of the joker's character and this is even maybe even more so with the joker that was played by um what's the recently deceased actor yeah um heath ledger yeah talk about um kind of a nietzschean outlook that's um I, li- I think that's a great example of social horror. Both of those films, that one with Heath Ledger and the newer one, mm. The Joker, just really point to the, um, the, uh, the, the fabric of the social fabric disintegrating mm-hmm. and, uh, and how that's frightening. Well, we're seeing it right before our eyes. Yeah. I mean, so it's like really relevant. Uh, and when you add in things like race, or gender or sexuality, you have the makings of some really interesting social horror. I I, I don't know if you've seen um, uh, Get Out. No. But Get Out. Okay, that's on your list, Winston. Okay. That's on your list. Uh, but just a great way of dealing with race through a horror horror scenario. Mm. Um, and it doesn't. It challenges that. So I mean, you have some horror movies that perpetuate really a conservative approach to um, to thinking about social change. And so there's they 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 build you they build up the horror around what we should be afraid of, the other. Mm-hmm. But in this one it kind of uh what who you should be afraid of is the hegemonic patriarchal white mm. establishment. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of movies that have come out in the last five years that do that which I think are really creative interventions in the horror uh, genre. Yeah. Um, interesting. Fantastic. I love it. Yeah. This is another good one. So I'll, I'll have to see those. Yeah. I, yeah. I do think like, you know, just talk a little bit about Joker just cause I, I did see that one. Um, it's a great film. yeah, it's, you know, this gets to kind of one of the things that's been on my mind a lot is sort of the lack of community that so many people experience. That's partly what I attribute to the success of uh, the Joker is speaking to that part of so many people feeling inside really isolated and and having a lack of community and uh, almost like to the point where I think a lot of us, you know, don't even realize how hungry we are for the intimacy of community. We think, well, we're connected through, through uh, you know, our, our social media accounts and all of that. But, but inside, really, just it all being very superficial and feeling as though we're just, we really have, have left that intimacy of community. And now, you know, here's the Joker, this kind of the epitome of this isolated person, the way he was portrayed, you know, somebody that really didn't have any friends at all you know um bullied ostracized (laughs) marginalized i think that's the experience of a lot of people i'm glad you really said that because 
that's really important dimension of what where horror is going and why the standard conventions don't work in, de in deciding well, is this a horror film or not. I mean, what the Joker does is, is it gets down deep into both the social and the psychological and how they intersect in this character right. and the, the mayhem and violence that erupt as a result. Yeah, It really does play on our fears given this particular part era that we're in. I yeah. think you're exactly right about the, the, the construction of the individual as sort of outside of a, so having, not having the social connections. So that horror is less about um, uh, sort of like alienation. Well, it is about alienation, that's for sure. But there's something more that's div divided in the psyche about this. Yeah, who, who, do, who do we, you. right, it's like, who do we become? when we are separated right. from everyone and everything, you know, we develop mental health issues, but then we don't have support. You know, they had the social worker, right. Who was just like, sorry, they're cutting us off. So you're, you're going to lose your medications in addition to all your social support. And so, and then there's the stigmatization of mental health there, you know, that, uh, and, and all that. Um, yeah. So it's, is it ultimately, is that film ultimately nihilistic that kind of, or do you see it as having a dimension of protest to it that like it's protesting against this? Yeah, I think it, I see it more as having a protest than saying that, uh, you know, it's possible for us to live in a different way, but I think we need to really come to terms with the ugliness of our way of life to, uh, to somehow before we can change that. Yeah, um, right. You know, it's recently, you know, I, I sometimes go on, you know, TikTok and all that. It's a, uh, interesting social media app but uh there was a person on there who who i guess his um his whole thing is he will kind of make fun of all the conspiracy theorists uh online all, you know all the people who are kind of the anti-maskers and that kind of thing and but he made this little uh post where he just said you know i scroll by all these comments and sometimes i go after the people who are the most racist or the most dangerous in their rhetoric and he said, but 90% of the people I scroll past, they just seem to me like they just want to belong to a club. They just want to belong to a group of some kind, of the feeling of belonging. And it's just so sad that these kind of this rhetoric fill conspiracy theorist uh, thing is, is what they, that's, that's the group that they've found, you know? And he's like, I wish there was an alternative, like a knitting group or something for these people you know <laughs> uh but you know that's what i think that's part really of what i'm yeah yeah i think there's something to that for sure yeah that's part of what i i think i'm trying to maybe accomplish by that's part of my motivation for going into ministry you know um and you know the church is in kind of a interesting uh place i guess in our society as a whole right now but uh that is one thing i like i said it's I wonder that we we need that uh, community stuff, you know. But oh, I think we do. Yeah. So, um, is is there a, is there an openness to you? Do you work with? Um, I'm I'm kind of think formulating a question here, but I'm trying to think it, on the ground as you work with people. Yep. Do you think there's an openness to looking at horror movies at all? Do you think that people would be interested in this? Is this a top, or I, I, I put in that article that I think horror is the least sensible to religious sensibilities yeah. other than porn of right. any, um, but what I meant by that is not because I agree with that. I, I mm. don't like that fact. Mm. I wish that religious people looked and wanted to look at it, but I understand why they don't. Yeah. But, um, well, I think there's a time for, you know, that, that confrontation. But it's, uh, I yeah. think it can be difficult for a lot of people. And I, I don't know, I think, like, I think there's just certain people where it's like, that's a matter of ta taste or whatever. You know, I have that element in myself that I've noticed, I guess, with video games, but, uh, and stuff like that. But in general, um, I try to keep that stuff to a minimal. It's like life's already in some ways can be pretty dark. And you know, when we yeah, look at right. the world, and I try to like, you know, well, let me get some wholesome stuff here if I, if I can, you know. Um, I think it can numb us to violence also. I mean, yeah. uh, that's just a larger theme uh, with cinema. Right. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. 
Yeah. I think that if I did teach a course though at a School of Theology on horror, I do a film or faith and film class already, and it's it does well. But I've always thought about, well, what if I did a horror film, <laughs> faith and horror film? Would it get as many people? Mm. Probably not. But there are some <laughs> people who love it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't we'll know. see where this book goes. Maybe this book, the faith and film book, has done very well. But uh, we'll see how the horror, the horror film book, is really about fear. Mm-hmm. It's about how fear gets constructed in the cinema, and just making a case is that. Christianity over the last hundred or more hundred and more years has shaped the way we construct fear. Yeah, uh, and so I want to do that through the cinema. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I wonder if um, you know. The, I can't help but ask and think about once again the popularity of the whole zombie. It's almost like its own genre, even. You know, it's just. Uh, I wonder. Do you feel like? Do you see that as being the same thing? A kind of a confrontation or. What I mean, what would you say that's about the kind of the popularity of and the fascination with uh, zombies, you know? Well, I do think it it plays on social fears of the social of social disorder. And um, I mean, it's very well. Uh, if you were to ask me prior to the pandemic, <laughs> I would have still said fears of viruses or um, Mm. of of the uh of the of the ability to keep things alive without life um mm. so just so it has a connection again to science and technology but now post pandemic i mean you you tend to want to interpret it a lot through the whole virus theme um uh and, but most zombie horror is or zombie is connected to, to viruses um you know, mutations yeah. mutations and viruses Right. I, I wonder, I think it was Peter Rollins, right? I don't know if I'll be able to do it justice, but he, he did a thing on, uh, it was like the zombie apocalypse has already happened. I think that maybe was a video he did and also maybe a, a chapter in one of his books. And um, it, like I said, I might not be able to do it justice, but I think what he was getting at there is that the zombie sort of, uh, he's big into psychoanalysis. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with him, but the zombie is kind of just the, the, the drives right of um uh that we have for just eat right and the anger that we we feel like the emotions that we don't have control over sometimes that we fear these forces within ourselves that we don't always feel totally in control of and that that sort of drive us our addictions right um and, and those types of things and and so we're we're always trying to keep those in control and, you know, because we're afraid of that. I think even in the church, right? It's like in certain denominations, they fear emotions and speaking in tongues and those kind of things, because that's all, that's not really, uh, you can't do that in a very orderly, uh, controlled way, right? So I guess he was just trying to portray the, the zombie symbolize our fear of everything inside of us that the animal part of ourselves. Right, I hear you. Um, I love this line of thought. I need to read that. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, zombies are on tap here coming up. And I have given some thought <laughs> to them, but not as much as I should. And I know there's been a lot of written on zombies and theology. Uh, I'm trying to think about that. Yeah. If uh, I find the chapter, I'll, I'll like let you know. Theme. I like that line of thought, though. That seems very helpful. Yeah. Uh, why at this time in human history are zombies right. so popular? That's what you got to answer. So is it? So yeah, let's say that uh, Rollins' line of thought is correct. Why though? Mm. Why now? Mm. What is it about our particular situation that makes us afraid of the animal inside of us, or the uncontrollable, or the instinctive? Um, right. I mean, one thing I, I I think I was listening to another podcast, and someone mentioned about just in terms of apocalyptic movies in general. Why? What's with the popularity of the? Um, uh, uh, dystopian films and maybe it's easier for us to uh, you know it's more difficult to imagine how we're going to um, overcome all the obstacles our society faces and it's just easier to imagine the ways in which it can fall apart and be destroyed but I don't know if that answers the question of why specifically a zombie apocalypse you know no, I, but I do think of the ap- Apocalypse. I mean, that part, that dimension of it is is a huge reason. Yeah. Uh, 
that yeah. we're still in a very we're even though we're way past Y2K, apocalyptic um, fear is still very prevalent and probably even more so now. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it goes back to the, you know, I think you mentioned at one point talking about the ego and Dr. Jekyll and uh, Mr. Uh, Hyde and all that. And and uh, maybe maybe the zombies are one manifestation of the ego as well of, uh, you know, when we kind of give over, give ourselves over to looking at our phones for eight hours a day and, and watching TV for another four hours a day and uh, giving into all these drives and and uh, kind of forgetting who we are in some sense, um, we just become a commodity, right? For all the corporations or whatever. Um, That's really good. That's really good thinking there. Yeah. And you know, it's not, not accidental that, um, oh, what's the guy who did Dawn of the Dead? Um, George Romero, hmm. that he filmed that in a, in a mall. Uh, and yeah. so that you just kind of are this mindless, <laughs> and even if you watch, if you watch the sidewalks at Brown BU School, Brown B Boston University, you yeah. see if you took away people's phones from them and just watched, them, <laughs> it would look like they're zombies. They're just kind of like what, they're staggering yeah. around. They're not looking ahead. Um, right. It's really, really funny. There's something to that, Winston. Yeah, There's something to it for sure. Interesting. Gosh, man. Now demons. One last thing before I know we're we're coming up short on time, but yeah. I, I I've been working. I worked over the last six months on demons and Satan. I cannot figure out why it is that demon possession stays so popular. It seems like this would just be so absurd. Mm. But ever since the 60s and 70s, demon possession movies and exorcism movies, most notably The Exorcist in 1972, um, just became very popular. They were very popular in the 70s, but they made a revival. It's like they just people keep churning them out. Mm. We want to see people possessed by the devil. <laughs> uh, what's going on here, Winston? What's happening? Why? Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because that is something that I kind of find a little bit terrifying in a way. Um, <laughs> not maybe so much anymore, but I, I, you know, I was sort of raised, you know, I, there, I went through a period of life where I was really um kind of in more of a evangelical baptist sort of context where i was i i was really believing in what i was reading in the bible in a very literal way and i've yeah. since i've since moved away from that sort of theology um but you know if you kind of talk to me when i was in that space um believing that demons are real and reading in scripture that demon possession happens and i think there's you know a significant part of the population, it seems, that maybe does still have uh, a sort of literalistic interpretation of scripture, um, then you, you kind of depict this in a horrifying way in movies. You know, it makes you, because like a demon, you know, it's like even a disease, right? It's like if we, if we kind of isolate ourselves and wear masks and all that and stay home, the disease maybe can't get us, right? We're kind of safe. But the demon can kind of materialize from God knows where. Right. You know, in yeah. your bed at night, uh, it can start speaking to you. So I think maybe it has maybe it speaks to some of the belief that people still have in in uh, in that sort of thing that maybe, uh, you know, who knows. Right. It's like maybe even with the pe people who say, oh, I don't believe in that. Maybe we still have some doubts sometimes and say, well, who knows? Maybe it is true. You know, <laughs> existence is weird. <laughs> it's, it's still capturing some sort of um, fear. Mm -hmm. because people still watch them. And I, I don't know if they're very successful, these movies, but they keep putting them out. They, they do a lot with attacks on the body. So that's also a prevalent theme in postmodern horror is the horror comes through the body, through the destruction of the body. And I think there's something to that. But there's some sort of reserve in us mm. that still wonders about this, that, that we might be invaded by a super, that our own bodies might be invaded. Yeah, and it has stuck around. It is. It's still there. Um, yeah, it's very. Uh, you know, whenever we're in a situation, maybe where we feel vulnerable, it's like I don't know. This this stuff does come up. I just in our dreams, and I don't. Know, I can't help but think of like this interesting story that happened to me relatively recently, where I was um, I was traveling and I had to stay in a, a hotel for one night, and uh, I was doing my first wedding. You know, and. Um, uh, and in the hotel room, I had this, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was just a dream, right? Where I was in the bed 
uh, in the hotel room and I, I almost like felt like this sensation of something pushing up from underneath the mattress, you know, and uh, it was kind of really, and I, I was like, then I kind of came to and I didn't feel that sensation anymore. So I think I was like, must have been 95% asleep or something when that happened. And it was like part of a dream. But, you know, it was pretty scary after that. I was like, what was that? You know, uh, and, you know I'm sure you know, it was nothing. Of course, There's, there was no underneath to the bed at all. But I don't know. I just I guess I'm just bringing that up because, um, you know, we have strange experiences and strange dreams. And, you know, our imagination comes up with a lot, you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it certainly does. I, I actually think that well, the hard thing about doing a movie about demon possession is you don't have the ability to do much characterization, uh, mm. which really drives narratives, is to have a good plot with great characters who are richly developed. Satan films have often been able to pull that off by really doing some great Satans, mm. like um, Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate, fantastic yeah. Satan. I've Robert seen that De Niro one. in Angel Heart. There's some great Satans out there, but there aren't any demon characters, so they're very hard to... So it's kind of this invisible but very real power that undermines and, and, and comes up through us or comes from the outside and we have no control over it. Uh, there's also a lot you can do. This is a gender dimension of it um, with uh, that's almost porn-like with, with what happens with exorcism because you can contort women's bodies. A lot of the people, over 70% of people possessed in the movies are female. So there's something, and they used to tend to be young females. Interesting. So there's also something there that's titillating with regard to the body and sexuality that's being that's happening in those films too. In yeah. addition to just the general fear of supernatural invading us. I mean, that's yeah. been around for a while. Well, it sounds like uh, you definitely have material for at least one book, huh? <laughs> there's tons of material here. There's tons yeah, of material. That's and, a lot. Um, and it's just a matter of trying to get it all organized. Vampire for me, I'm, so that's what the chapter I'm on right now, and um, it's mm. the hardest for me because I, I have to confess that I don't really care much for vampire movies. They, <laughs> I don't ever, I don't get it. They're not scary to me. They, they don't. Now I'm going to back off of this after I say it, but they don't represent an existential threat to my existence mm. that I really fear. Whereas the fear of the other and the witch, or the fear of the dead and the ghost, or the fear of the supernatural. But like, I don't, why would you even care about a vampire? I mean, so you have to, I have to think differently and deeper about this. It's almost the only one where you might consider actually the trade-off between becoming the vampire, right? Exactly. You're actually, why it's a not, temptation. Yeah. Why should we be afraid of this? And uh, You might yeah, be immortal. You might have superpowers. And, uh, you know, the, the bad thing is you have to <laughs> drink blood and, and you can't go out in the daylight. But other than that, you have superpowers and you live forever. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah. And even the cross, I mean, the religious symbols have become less effective in kind of thwarting the vampire. So the vampire is yeah. becoming more and more powerful. Vampire films also, surprisingly, don't go away. Yeah. People keep making him. I mean, there maybe the I mean Satan is the most I think filmed character, but Vamp Dracula's close behind, that's for sure. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's true. They 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 get depicted a lot in movies that really aren't horror movies, like Twi the Twilight series, uh right. the Blade, the Blade series. I like Blade, my wife likes Twilight, you know. <laughs> so tr or True Blood. Yeah, there's, right. there's been a lot of attention to vampires recently. Yeah. Just as I say, won't go away. Um, as uninteresting and un, um, innovative, I think a character is as vampires. Um, people still find ways to creatively new do re redo them, and there I guess there is still something about the raw sexuality, the exchange of fluids, the power, the uh, ability to control other people mm. that comes with a vampire that still makes it a popular mm. uh, popular horror film. Fascinating. Well, working on it, working on it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for uh, being a guest on the Second Table podcast, Brian. It was good to reconnect and it was a very yeah, fascinating and fun conversation. It is fun. Good luck with your with your podcast and thanks for connecting up. Yeah, absolutely. Till next time. <laughs>